Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's virtual program with Turnstile Tours. Um, I am Andrew Gustafson, uh, and um, I hope everybody had a good weekend and relaxing uh, May Day if you celebrate, uh, which is part of the reason why we're doing this program today. Um, to talk about the labor history uh, of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, but we're gonna take a look back today and look at the history uh, of the yard um, through the lens of labor. Um, this is a topic that has interested me for a long time. And uh, obviously it's a really important part of the yard's history, but it's very easy to get wrapped up in the story of ships uh, and the story of the Navy itself. Um, you know, if you go into Building 92, just as an example, uh, you know, our exhibit is so much about um, naval officers uh, and the exploits of the Navy, when really the story of the yard is much more about civilian workers uh, and the people who actually built the ships in the yard. And so that's what we're going to talk about uh, on the program today. Uh, so I thought I would actually open things uh, with a little song. Um, and so I want to play a song for you. It's a couple people whose voices we're going to hear later on as well, uh, who worked at the yard during World War II. So this is um, Sylvia Everett and Ida Pollock. So we'll just open with a little song. Oh, you can't scare me. I'm sticking to the union. Yeah, I'm sticking to the union. <laughs> I'm sticking to the union. You know where we come. Oh, you can't scare <laughs> me. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union till, till the day, day I die. Yeah. So what we're going to talk about today is, is what exactly that means. Um, because again, when talking about labor history, it's very easy to um, just completely conflate labor history with union history, um, but that's actually only a small part of the story we're going to share today because uh, the Brooklyn Navy Yard is over 220 years old uh, and existed long before um, the era of um, formal unionization. But we're going to talk about the ways in which uh, workers organized and agitated uh, for their rights uh, and negotiated with the Brooklyn Navy Yard and how the Brooklyn Navy Yard as a federal institution uh, was different from some of the other workplaces um, that some of these workers might have been in. For example, looking at private shipyards as well uh, along the waterfront uh, in New York City. Um, but I first wanted to just mention uh, the term uh, strike. We don't just wanna talk about strikes either. That's another thing that happens often in labor history is we get so focused uh, on, those, um, on those moments of, of conflict, which are obviously very important, but they're not the only formative moments uh, when we talk about the course of labor history. Um, but you can't talk about labor history without talking about the waterfront um, because it's really the origin point for so much labor organization. Uh, and actually the word itself strike uh, comes from, uh, it's a seafaring term uh, and it comes from strike the sails. Uh, but here's a painting we can see the, the London uh, waterfront along the um, Thames. Um, and it was in 1768 um, that a group of workers uh, who were uh, loading and unloading ships uh, along the London docks um, went on strike um, to demand uh, better wages and better working conditions. And they did that by striking the sails uh, of these ships um, and taking, taking them down so they couldn't go anywhere. Um, so they uh, essentially commandeered these ships. Um, and so that's the origin of, of the term strike. Uh, and it's not surprising that um, so much labor activism has its origins uh, on the waterfront and in seafaring, um, because these were um, obviously um, very critical workers. You could not operate um, ships without them, um, but they were also workers that um, tended to have a, a fair amount of autonomy. Um, to a degree, uh, maybe not so much in institutions like the Royal Navy, um, but workers that were uh, working on ships, you know, they could travel around the world and they could go from ship to ship and company from, comp uh, from company to company. Um, and they did have a fair degree of autonomy. So it's, it's not surprising um, that this was sort of the origin um, of the labor movement in many ways and where we get the, the term uh, strike. Um, now, we could to have a much different program today and talk about the labor history of the waterfront. Obviously, that is a huge topic, 
Um, but most of the workers we're going to talk about are somewhat separate from what we typically think about when we think about, for example, the movie On the Waterfront. Uh, we're talking about dock workers, right? Um, so those are workers who are loading and unloading the ships. What we're talking about today uh, is primarily going to be ship workers, so those who are actually building the ships. Um, so there's a different set of skills and a different set of um, trade organizations that they were involved in. So obviously they're working in the same kind of arena um, of the city. Um, they're both working on the waterfront. And in many cases, they're working side by side, um, in uh, especially places like uh, Red Hook and Sunset Park. You'd have shipyards, you know, right next to uh, warehouses and docks um, where ships were being loaded and unloaded. Um, that wasn't so much the case at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, the Brooklyn Navy Yard did not have uh, a large group of um, dock workers, longshoremen uh, that were there. So it was part of the waterfront, but in some ways separate um, from the larger waterfront in Brooklyn that we think of um, as this huge complex of, um, of docks and warehouses. Um, so when talking about ship workers, um, these were actually some of the earliest workers in New York City to start to organize. Um, now, for the most part, we're talking about skilled workers. And that's what we're going to talk about almost for the first century uh, of the story today, is that the workers who were organizing were the ones who actually had um, skills. Um, and so they had a fair amount of power and clout within the workplace. And so they were organized into various types of, of craft and trade unions, even if going back to the 1830s, which is the period we're talking about right now, um, they weren't technically organized into what today we would consider um, to be a union. Um, but some of the first workers to organize were these skilled shipbuilders who were working in Corlier's Hook. So Corlier's Hook um, is that area today we consider sort of part of the Lower East Side, that um, big bend in the East River, uh, directly across the river from the Brooklyn Navy Yard, actually. Um, and, so, uh, and so, you know, it extended up to, you know, 10th Street, almost to 14th Street. Um, you would find shipyards there um, all along that, that stretch of Manhattan waterfront. Um, and many of the biggest shipbuilders in the country um, doing wooden shipbuilding, um, you know, starting in the, in the late 18th century. Um, in 1831, um, workers started to demand a reduction in their hours. Um, so a typical workday during the summertime might extend to 15 hours. So you'd basically work for as, as long as there was daylight. Uh, workers wanted to negotiate uh, basically a fixed 10-hour workday um, with the shipyard owners, um, to which the ship owners replied no, and then the negotiations reached the point where they said essentially that uh, yes, but for uh, a significant reduction in pay. You know, if you're going to be working 33% less, then you get paid 33% less. Uh, and so um, they sort of came to an impasse, um, but eventually were able to, you know, pressure the ship own, shipyard owners enough um, because they had so much power. This was a relatively small group of extremely skilled craftspeople uh, who had been apprenticing in some cases for decades, um, and they made the businesses run. Um, and so there wasn't a whole lot of negotiation that the ship owners could do um, because this cadre of very, very skilled workers uh, was able to organize. And so eventually what they came up with was a compromise uh, where they agreed to a 10 hour workday, although it would shift slightly as the, uh, as the daylight hours shifted throughout the season. Um, and they erected a bell um, in 1831. Um, which was uh, right around East 10th Street, between East 10th and East 11th. Um, and it was actually the workers themselves who pooled money to pay uh, another worker um, to go and ring the bell at the beginning of the workday and the end of the workday. So um, this really um, you know, was sort of a fixture, a centerpiece of this vast shipbuilding complex uh, in Corlier's Hook. Uh, now, when we talk about the ship workers who are across the river over in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, it took a little bit longer. Um, but again, we see the Brooklyn, uh, we, we see the federal Navy Yards uh, as also an important nexus of organizing federal employees, um, because the first strike uh, 
ever by federal employees uh, was in 1835, not at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, but at the Washington Navy Yard. Uh, and again, it was a strike that was over hours in part, um, but it also had a racial dimension to it uh, as well. Um, and so in 1835, um, workers at the Washington Navy Yard um, went, went on strike. And I say that you know, this is the first strike by federal employees. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that for much of American history, the largest part of the federal workforce uh, was actually the public shipyards. Um, so at this time in 1835, we had uh, now seven public shipyards. Um, so Portsmouth, New Hampshire, Boston, uh, New York, Philadelphia, Washington, Norfolk, and then they'd recently um, started building the, the shipyard uh, in Pensacola, Florida. Um, the federal government didn't do a whole lot um, <laughs> beyond, beyond you know, building ships um, that required a, a large workforce. It didn't have a huge bureaucracy. Even the Postal Service uh, wasn't terribly large. Um, and so a, a huge proportion of the workers were actually, uh, of the civilian employees, um, the military is obviously a different story, but even in that case, it's relatively small um, in peacetime. Um, so these shipyard workers are, are a huge part of the, uh, of the federal workforce. Um, and so what they're pushing for is a 10 hour workday. You know, I said there was a racial dimension to this because uh, what's happening at the Washington Navy Yard um, during this time period um, is that we're seeing a larger and larger number uh, of, of black workers um, in the yard. Um, part of this is um, free black workers coming in um, as the free black population in Washington starts to increase. Um, but part of it as well is um, civilian, white civilian employees as well as officers in the Navy leasing out enslaved people um, to the Navy um, and collecting their wages for themselves. Uh, and so this starts to um, create a lot of conflict as many of the, the white workers, uh, those who, who can't afford um, to own enslaved people themselves, um, it, it starts to create this conflict and lead to, um, um, you know, not only this strike, um, but also a massive riot in 1835 in Washington, D.C., um, where, you know, um, it's a you know racially motivated riot, riot called the Snow Riot, um, which leads to a number of people being killed and houses being destroyed in, in black districts around Washington, D.C. So um, a very, very ugly um, history, but it does eventually lead to the workers getting uh, a 10 hour workday. And that is eventually extended to all of the federal shipyards uh, in 1840. Um, and this was done sort of as a, a political maneuver because 1840 is an election year. Um, and that leads, uh, and that is um, initiated by President Martin Van Buren. It's a very, very um, tight race uh, with William Henry Harrison, um, which Harrison ultimately ends up winning. Um, but uh, this uh, moment where we get the 10 hour workday at the Brooklyn Navy Yard is enshrined by the installation of another bell. Uh, and so this, um, this, uh, Bell, hung, we don't exactly know where it was installed or when it was installed, probably sometime around 1840. Um, but for a long time, it actually hung in building 20. Um, and this uh, article about it comes from the um, Brooklyn Navy Yard newspaper, The Ship Worker, uh, in 1943. Um, so this states that the bell itself was cast in 1812. Um, but uh, it actually became uh, an important symbol um, because as you can see here, uh, what they actually did during World War II when they installed a yard-wide public address system uh, and they marked the, the changing of the shifts, they actually recorded this exact bell uh, and played it over, uh, over the PA. Um, we'll mention this bell again. This bell has um, been lost to history. If anyone knows anything about this or where it may have gone, uh, we're trying to track it down uh, in part um, because there are new occupants in Building 20. This is now the home of a company called Nanotronics, uh, and they're very interested in finding out what happened uh, to this bell. Um, I have an idea of a little where, where it might, may have been um, in a little bit later period, but 
don't really know what happened to it after the closure of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Perhaps we can ask our friends uh, down uh, at the museum in the Washington Navy Yard, because um, a lot of uh, ephemera um, from the Brooklyn Navy Yard wound up down there, including our, our whistle. So there was a whistle that was actually uh, blown um, for the launching of all the ships throughout the 20th century. And that's, that's on display in the museum. That would be a nice thing to have back in, in Building 92. Um, yeah, so one of the um, one of the professions, like I mentioned, that was um, started to become dominated by by black workers um, in southern shipyards, um, not just in Washington, but in Baltimore and other areas, um, was the profession of uh, of caulking. Um, and we actually talked about this uh, on one of the programs that we did last year for for Black History Month. Um, how actually the first um, corporation in the United States, the first black owned corporation uh, was started by a group of skilled caulkers um, on the Baltimore uh, waterfront. Um, but this is not so much an issue in the Brooklyn Navy Yard um, because we always had a relatively small black workforce and because post uh, 1827 uh, slavery uh, was illegal in New York state, um, there were few if any opportunities um, for officers to uh, rent out um, enslaved people um, to the Navy. Um, so we didn't have the same dimension of the, of the conflict, but ultimately in 1840, we get the 10 hour workday um, for the Brooklyn Navy Yard, just as they had gotten a few years earlier in Washington. And that applies to all of the Navy Yards uh, around the country. Um, now at this time, um, workers, are organizing, um, but again, it, it's not something that would we would see in any way kind of resemble what we would call today a union. Um, but we do have, you know, skilled workers um, who are starting to organize into committees, um, and then of course you have large numbers of um, I don't want to say unskilled workers, but a lot of apprentices and laborers um, who aren't entitled to the same level of respect, certainly not the same level of pay, and are excluded from even these sort of informal organizations um, that are starting to form uh, in the yard. Um, and so the ship's carpenters would actually stage the first strike along with other workers, uh, other skilled workers at the Navy Yard um, in 1865. Um, so actually right at the very, very tail end um, just actually within days of the end of the Civil War, um, that these workers uh, would go on strike. Um, here we can see this is April 12th, 1865. Um, and so we have a walkout of about 1,200 workers uh, at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Now, at this time, the workforce is starting to die down. Uh, it had reached a peak of about 7,000 during the Civil War. Um, but even here, it's, it's, it's several thousand. Um, so about 1,200 of them are these skilled workers um, that, that walk out. Um, and so they're demanding um, not an increase in wages, but um, the federal government had actually proposed a decrease in wages as economy savings with the, with the end of the war. Um, and this little article here um, sort of explains a little bit about how wages were set uh, within the, uh, the federal Navy Yard system. Um, and so it says they have agents who would actually go out to private shipyards in the local area and assess what the prevailing wages were um, and then use that to set a pay scale. And so this was done every two months um, at this point in the mid 19th century. Uh, and so during this time, what the federal government is proposing is actually a cut in their wages of about of, of 50 cents, um, which was less actually than the prevailing wage you could find out um, in the private market. Um, and it says here that the workers uh, actually had every opportunity um, to make better money. They could just walk out the gates of the Navy Yard and, and go to another shipyard down the street uh, and get paid more money. So um, they were at risk of, of genuinely losing these workers. And when they went on their brief uh, strike, uh, they actually, most of them still worked that day. They just went and worked at a, at a different shipyard. Uh, but here you can see some of the um, some of the um, types of workers that are represented. So you can see there's caulkers, uh, ship carpenters, uh, spar makers, uh, and joiners. Um, and basically all of these are skilled woodworkers uh, of some kind who are making different components of ships. Um, now, during this time as well, we're seeing a transition um, in the type of materials and technology that's used in the construct construction of ships at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, and that would also uh, lead to conflict um, in 
the federal Navy yards all across the country, um, because as you have this transition from wooden shipbuilding to more iron shipbuilding, um, you have more mechanization um, and you need workers with, with different types of skills. And so the, skill, the, the workers sort of with um, the older types of skills are, are getting pushed out. Um, now, I say here that workers, you know, they went on strike, um, but we have to remember that all of these workers um, were employed at the complete whim of, of the federal government and the supervisors uh, at the Brooklyn Navy, both the civilian supervisors as well as the military supervisors. Um, and so, you know, all of these, there was no sort of negotiation. The only negotiating power that they had was that it would probably be hard to replace those workers. Um, but they were not bound by any law um, to keep these workers, and they could all be fired at any time. Um, and in fact, being a worker at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, um, there was a constant yo-yo um, of, uh, of uh, hirings and firings all the time. Now, in part, that was driven by you know, um, the geopolitical situation. Um, so obviously, wartime, you see a big uh, spike in employment. But there were smaller factors that would also lead to... Um, you know, large scale hirings and firings. Some of it was the season. Um, so, you know, during the winter time, there was less work to be done um, so that you'd have mass layoffs in the winter. Uh, it could be the availability of materials. Um, and so if you have a supply chain disruption, you might have hundreds or even, you know, thousands of workers be, be laid off um, even just temporarily. Um, but one of the biggest impacts on workers and their ability to work consistently was political. Um, and the fact of the matter is, this is one of the reasons why the federal uh, shipyards existed. Now, their stated reasons for existing, and I've said this many times before, uh, were, of course, to furnish ships for the federal government and to keep those ships in good working order. Um, they were designed to be storehouses um, for the Navy um, and supply ships. Uh, they were also meant to maintain a skilled cadre of ship workers uh, who could be mobilized um, in, in the event of a national emergency. And they were also meant to give the federal government a point of comparison for costs of ships. So they were meant to actually be a sort of public option in terms of competition uh, for shipbuilding and ship repair. And so the government, uh, just like here, they're working with, they're looking at private industry to set their wages. Um, the Navy Yards are also, you know, tabulating and calculating their own costs for materials and labor uh, when they're going out and contracting out construction at private shipyards. So they have, they can use the public yards um, as a point of comparison in that way. But the unstated reason for the existence of the federal shipyards is that this was the largest pool of federal jobs uh, and they could be doled out for political patronage per, uh, purposes. Um, and this had always been an issue um, throughout the 19th century. Um, and it would become a, a, a major um, political controversy um, when we get into the 1870s, 80s, and 90s. Um, and so here you can see uh, this political cartoon, which is commenting uh, on um, a couple different things, you know, this, this rot that was permeating not just the, the federal yards, um, because you had all, you know, basically the workers, including the skilled workers and the and what were called the, the mechanics, um, who were supervisors. Um, you also saw that in private shipyards with, um, with this contracting out of, um, of private ship, shipyard jobs. Um, Oh, someone asked, uh, these wages are for what period of time? Oh, sorry, I gotta go back here. Uh, these wages are for what period of time? Um, this was uh, in 1865, um, this was um, per day, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, Okay, so you see this, um, you see this uh, rot um, that's really permeating the Navy. Um, and it's something that began um, obviously before the Civil War with the whole patronage system. But after the Civil War, you know, you see large disinvestment uh, from the Navy by the federal government. Um, 
And so, you know, you see the workforce and the shipyards, you know, start to rot away and you have massive political corruption um, and these private shipbuilders are starting to cash in on it. Uh, the person you see here in the center wearing the top hat, this is John Roach, um, who owned a, a massive shipyard in Chester, Pennsylvania. Um, he had been given the contract in 1881 uh, for the first steel ships uh, in the U.S. Navy, what are called the ABCB ships. Um, and these ships were taking forever to build. Um, and upon closer inspection, it was revealed that they were of extremely poor quality. So um, this was under the administration first of James A. Garfield, uh, a Republican who was then assassinated and replaced by one of our most corrupt presidents, um, at least in his pre-presidential life, uh, which is Chester A. Arthur. Um, they were then, uh, that administration was then defeated in the election of 1884 by a Democrat um, in Grover Cleveland um, and started to, to clean house. So part of it was the fact that the ships that Roach was building were of extremely poor quality. Uh, part of it also was uh, political payback um, that the contracts were voided uh, and the hulks of these ships taken away from him and, and taken to public yards to be completed as the first steel ships uh, built in the, uh, in, in the US Navy and, and really the unfortunately the federal shipyards um, were not really equipped uh, either in terms of the equipment or the skills um, to work in steel at that point again these are the first steel ships that they've encountered so these ships did not perform very well um, they took another number of years um, to complete and had very very short service lives but again this was all the product um, of this uh, pervasive corruption um, that you saw throughout the um, um th throughout the Navy uh, during this time period. Um, and, you know, you also see uh, an effort um, to try and again, sort of protect the incumbent workforce, both for political reasons, um, from the sort of political patrons, um, as well as from the workers themselves. Um, this leads to in 1892, for example, a, a big change um, in the um, you know, it would impact the composition of the workforce of the Brooklyn Navy Yard, but uh, basically no foreign workers are allowed to work uh, in the yard anymore. So they're all dismissed. We would see another uh, wave of dismissals of both the military staff and the civilian staff that's foreign born in uh, 1906 and 1907 as well. Um, so again, there's, there's this constant um, pressure to try and protect the incumbent workforce, um, just as we saw uh, back in the 1830s with the conflict over black workers coming uh, into the Washington uh, Navy Yard. Um, so it's all a very kind of cozy, close-knit uh, system. But, you know, the assassination of James A. Garfield um, in 1881 would, would have a, a large impact on the entire federal bureaucracy and the Navy Yard specifically, um, because um, James A. Garfield was murdered by a patronage seeker. Um, he did not get a postmaster position um, that he was hoping for as a political donor. And so he killed the president over it. Um, and so even though Chester A. Arthur um, graft and patronage was his bread and butter, uh, he was forced into signing um, uh, a reform bill for the civil service um, during his administration. Uh, and so this would lead to um, a reform really largely of the white collar workforce of the federal government, but it would eventually lead to civil service reform within the Brooklyn Navy Yard as well, um, and start to you know, break the stranglehold that the political parties had um, over, over the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, you know, one of the you know, things that you often see uh, during this time period, um, during the mid 19th century, um, was you know, in uh, late October, you'd see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of workers be added to the payroll uh, for the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, and then they would go and vote in the election in November. And then a couple of weeks later, they would all be discharged. Um, that was a very common practice. And actually one of our, uh, uh, one of the um, commandants of the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, 
uh, Renshaw uh, back in 1841. He was dismissed in part um, because the political bosses of Brooklyn uh, were upset that he only gave workers half a day off um, to go and vote on election day uh, because they should have been entitled to a full day off to do all of the electioneering that was demanded of them uh, in exchange for the positions that they received in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, so this is a big part of the story uh, when talking about the yard in the 19th century. Um, uh, and, you know, the, the political corruption would, would have real consequences in terms of the low quality of, of ships and construction that was done uh, in the yard during this time period. Um, you know, one of the sort of champions of civil service reform um, uh, during the late 19th century uh, was Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, in his various positions, uh, he had, you know, a meteoric rise um, going through, you know, like five different jobs in almost as many years uh, in New York City and state. And then in the federal government, you know, he gets appointed the assistant secretary of the Navy. Um, uh, and around this time, he actually um, does a... Um, a survey of the Brooklyn Navy Yard um, to try and root out corruption. Um, so he's tasked um, by the Navy Department to go and, and, you know, there are a number of complaints that have been um, leveled uh, against uh, the Navy Yard, that there is corruption and favoritism and nepotism going on within the yard. Um, he actually writes a, a pretty watered down sort of whitewashed uh, report. Um, it's unclear exactly why he did this. Um, he basically claims that, you know, the only people who are complaining are, again, incumbent workers, uh, most of whom who are Civil War veterans, because another thing that changes after the Civil War is that um, the federal government starts to give preference um, to military veterans um, in employment for uh, um, for jobs in Navy yards. Uh, he basically says it's all these old timers uh, who've been working in the yard for 30 years who are, who are complaining um, about these reforms. Um, you know, when there was still a genuine issue of, of political uh, corruption uh, happening within the yard, it's, it's not totally clear to me. Again, I'm not a total expert on this subject. It's not totally clear to me why he uh, wrote such a sort of watered down whitewashed uh, report. Um, it may have been because Teddy Roosevelt was, you know, by this time a, a, a very committed navalist. Uh, and the following year in 1898, you know, he would become, you know, a huge national figure um, for his involvement um, in the Spanish-American War. Um, and you know, it, it may be that he did not, he felt that writing a critical report um, would undermine um, the, the Navy in, in some way. Um, but, you know, during his time as, uh, as vice president uh, and, and president, um, you know, he would, he would be a, a, actually a, a pretty strong proponent um, of civil service reform um, during his administration. Um, and also, you know, relatively, this, uh, you know, for the time, a relatively strong supporter of, of, of unions and the right of workers to organize as well. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, you know, we see this change in technology, which leads to a change in um, in the the different types of jobs that you have in the yard. This is just a, a good example uh, of the uh, the impact that changing technology would have. Although it's a, you know it's a small group of workers and not central to the work that the Brooklyn Navy Yard did. Um, but again, mechanization would continue apace. And we're seeing this at this time as well in the early 20th century, uh, a lot of cases in which workers are being replaced by machines. Um, this was less so the case at the Brooklyn Navy Yard because they were primarily doing construction, but at other shipyards, um, naval shipyards that were doing a lot more manufacturing work, meaning they're making supplies um, for the Navy. Um, so for example, the Washington Navy Yard was uh, a gun arsenal they were making uh, guns for naval ships uh, in Boston. I know they made a lot of rope um, and things like that. So um, you're seeing more and more of these types of jobs being mechanized, um, less so at the, yard, at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, um, with the exception of uh, really uniforms and flags. Um, there wasn't large scale manufacturing of, of many products that were used sort of ac across the Navy, sort of mass manufactured products. Um, but here we see that uh, pneumatic tubes uh, were installed in the yard. I also don't know what happened to the mag uh, pneumatic tube network um, that was built in 1907, uh, if any uh, of it still exists. I'm sure it's like in a lot of uh, buildings in Manhattan where there's now just sort of conduit telephone lines and fiber optic cable that's, that's running through it now. So I'm sure some of it still exists, but I actually, I don't think 
I've ever encountered um, anywhere in the yard sort of the, the vestigial um, pneumatic tubes around. But you can see that about 50 messengers uh, lost their jobs in the yard as a result of this uh, new technology coming in. So, you know, during the early uh, 20th century, you know, we see a number of, uh, of important moments um, in, in the uh, history of labor organizing um, that come about. Um, you know, in 1908 um, is when you start to see um, these sort of trade groups uh, or craft, I don't even want to call them unions, but um, they start to be organized in 1908 under the American Federation of Labor. Um, and that sort of continues the trend that had been in place up until that point, you know, throughout the 19th century, which is that it's really this only the, the skilled workers <clears throat> and the most senior workers um, who are entitled to any sort of organizing and, and protection. Um, now, this was not officially recognized um, by anyone, um, but in 1912, uh, the Lloyd La Follette Act, um, which is a, a federal law, um, basically um, allowed, um, gave federal workers the right to, to join unions. Um, now, it doesn't mean that the federal government had to recognize those unions or collectively bargain with them, um, but you couldn't be punished for, for joining one. Um, so they were much sort of looser associations um, <clears throat> than what would come into place uh, later on. Um, so in 1908, you sort of have the AFL start to <clears throat> um, establish a presence uh, in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, and then in 1913, um, you have the introduction of shop representation. Um, so basically the um, different shops, again, mostly composed of the skilled workers are allowed to vote and sort of elect representation that can make grievances. Um, again, they're not allowed to collectively bargain. They're not allowed to negotiate over wages and they're certainly not allowed to go on strike, at least not legally. Um, but you're starting to see the kind of growth of these um, of these representative organizations um, that will uh, that will grow uh, in the coming uh, in the coming decades. But you know, one thing is that um, in the wake of World War One, uh, we see one of the first major major strike waves across the country um, in 1919. The Brooklyn Navy Yard isn't really part of that um, again because the federal workers are sort of <clears throat> set apart. Uh, in that they don't have the right to strike, they don't have the right to organize um, under federal law. Again, you can join you can join a union if you want, but you can't actually collectively bargain and exercise the union's power in any sort of real way. <clears throat> so while we have these major strike waves that happen, like in 1919, uh, we don't actually see strikes at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, you know, after um, after World War I, you know, we have this huge strike wave across the country, and then it becomes uh, tamped down pretty quickly, uh, in part because of um, a lack, a loss of public support due to the Red Scare uh, and associating, you know, any sort of union organizing with, you know, communist revolution. Um, and so it's, it's relatively short-lived in this post-World War I um, period. Then it starts to come back in the 1930s during, during the Great Depression. We have another major strike wave um, that sort of reaches its peak in 1937. Um, this is where you have the major sit down strikes at GM. But you also have a huge, huge strikes here in New York City, um, including in the summer of 1937, uh, uh, basically <clears throat> at all of the, um, the private shipyards um, in New York Harbor, um, including in Brooklyn, Staten Island, uh, and even over in New Jersey. Eventually, you know, this strike would grow um, to affect 16 yards and about 15,000 workers at one point or another uh, would, would walk off um, the job. Um, you know, the, the real meat of the strike uh, is relatively short-lived at the beginning, um, but it extends all the way up until, um, so it starts on June 14th and, and lasts all the way up until August 11th, um, so almost two full months. Um, and this strike is organized by a, a relatively new organization, which is called the Industrial Union of Marine and Shipbuilding Workers, uh, which is part of the Cong Congress of International Organizations, or the CIO. So this is before the AFL and the CIO merge, uh, and they have their very different purposes. The CIO is trying to uh, organize mass unions, not just the skilled workers, um, but the less senior, 
quote unquote, less skilled workers uh, as well. They're trying to organize all of the workers within a workplace, not just keep them sort of siloed into um, their different, um, uh, you know, organizations of their different trades, uh, which is the case that you had up until this point. Um, now, this created a lot of conflicts. Um, this, for example, you can see workers out on the street by the Robbins Dry Dock in, in Red Hook. Um, and, you know, many of the workers did not want the CIO um, to get involved. Uh, and they had a union, sort of. Uh, they actually um, did have a union that was um, controlled by the company. Um, basically. And that was actually the ruling of the uh, NLRB in, in 1938 that would basically dissolve the company union, um, give the CIO the legal right to organize workers uh, at Robbins Dry Dock and other of the Todd-owned shipyards um, around, uh, around the harbor. Um, and that was sort of what was happening at the Brooklyn Navy Yard too. You know, you have these shop committees, um, but they're really sort of controlled and directed by um, the administration of the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and you don't have um, any real sort of autonomy. Uh, and again, um, you don't have, as federal workers, you don't really have any of those levers um, to strike and negotiate over wages um, that, that even technically these company controlled unions uh, within the private shipyards uh, had as well. But that NLRB ruling in 1938 would, like I said, would actually dissolve the, uh, would dissolve the, the company controlled union um, that was in place at, at Todd Shipyards. Um, so you have this big strike wave, um, but again, it didn't really impact um, the Brooklyn Navy Yard in any sort of direct way. We don't have any strikes that, that take place. We don't have any sort of major major pickets. It's sort of this, this world apart, whereas like basically the entire Brooklyn waterfront uh, is, you know, there's, there's fighting in the streets between picketers and, uh, and people that are trying to cross the picket lines and this conflict between the AFL and the CIO. Um, that's not really happening at the, at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Mm. Um, although in 1937, right around the, the time uh, that this strike is happening at the private shipyards, they do uh, grant, you know, quote unquote recognition uh, to the CIO as well as the AFL within um, the Brooklyn Navy Yard. But it says the new basis of equality consists of a place on yard bulletin boards to post notices of meetings and permission to collect dues in the payday line. Um, and so it says this is in accordance with a recent order of the Navy Department ordering government yards to place all outside organizations having Navy Yard membership on equal footing in freedom to collect dues uh, and communicate with the members outside of working hours. But again, this isn't any sort of uh, formal, formal recognition. Um, and here you can see that the union that starts to come into the Brooklyn Navy Yard is the Industrial Union of Marine and Shipbuilding Workers of America, um, the same one that was organized in the private yards, but they really don't um, make any sort of significant headways um, into the yard within this sort of uh, framework of this particular union. And again, um, during this strike wave as well that we have in the late 1930s, um, there is a lot of, um, you know, pressure um, placed on them uh, and criticism, public criticism uh, and criticism by politicians um, about um, their uh, communist uh, affiliations, um, which, which were legitimate. Um, but it was also used as a scare tactic as well to completely delegitimize uh, unions entirely. Um, so here you can see this is um, a rather sensational article um, that was in the Brooklyn Navy Yard in uh, the Brooklyn Daily Eagle in 1938. Uh, but it says here the yard voice was distributed on Brooklyn Navy Yard workers in February, according to uh, to uh, testify the Communist Party of the Daily Worker, which announced, of course, it will be the most important means of for opening the eyes of the Navy Yard workers to class consciousness and rally them for the final aim of the Communist Party, the overthrow of the capital system, and the establishment of a Soviet America with all that implies. Um, and so this was actually part of um, the uh, Dyes Committee, uh, which um, Henry Dice Jr. was a congressman from Texas uh, who headed the uh, House Un-American Activities Committee, which had its, it actually was started in 1938, um, but of course would become much more well-known uh, in the post-war periods uh, under the leadership of uh, Senator Joseph McCarthy. Um, but, you know, you had this, this going on as well to try and delegitimize the unions. Um, you know, one of the few cases of actual striking um, that we have take 
you know, take place in the Brooklyn Navy Yard in the 20th century, at least, um, is uh, in 1941, July 1941, you have a huge citywide strike um, of uh, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. Um, and they uh, basically picket this construction project, which you can see right behind uh, in the back of the photo. Uh, this is Building 77, uh, which was under construction uh, at the time. Um, this strike only lasts three days, um, so it only briefly interrupts uh, the construction project when they basically signed the the um, the union signs a, a deal, makes a deal with the federal government that you know they would continue their strike, which is primarily against Con Edison, um, but they would um, basically exclude defense-related projects uh, from that. Even though this is before Pearl Harbor, um, you know we're starting to really ramp up. Um, uh, war production, and there's a huge, huge uh, expansion project underway at the Brooklyn Navy Yard at this moment um, as well. Um, and this is something you would see in unions across the country that would basically make sort of a, a peace deal um, with the federal government and with private employers um, throughout World War II, uh, where you see a very, very limited number of strikes. However, literally, just like in World War I, you know, literally the moment the war ends in, in 1945, uh, you see the biggest strike wave in American history that would extend through 1946. Um, in New York, um, one of the biggest parts of that strike and the, one of the biggest impacts it has is on the waterfront, you have a huge strike of not only longshoremen, but also tugboat workers um, that would basically you know, completely um, bring the port to a halt uh, in January of 1946. Um, but again, the Brooklyn Navy Yard is largely excluded from this. You know, we don't see we don't see these major strike actions uh, happening uh, within the Brooklyn Navy Yard um, at this time. Um, but during World War II, um, or again in in the the lead up to World War II, um, we do see a major organizing effort that's taking place, uh, which is called the March on Washington movement um, in 1941, organized by Baird Rustin and A. Philip Randolph, um, and they want to organize a march on Washington to demand. Um, you know, better jobs and better housing and equal and fair treatment. Um, this is in the summer of 1941. And again, the, the, the country is starting to uh, ramp up our war production. Uh, President Roosevelt is trying to get America, um, you know, both um, sort of physically prepared and, you know, emotionally prepared to go to war. Uh, and is laying the groundwork for that and really fears that um, a march on Washington would, would cause a, a major disruption to the sort of national solidarity that he's trying to build um, to try and build support for, you know, American support of the allies in the war. Uh, and so in the summer of uh, 1941, in an effort to kind of um, stave off this movement, he signs the executive order 8802, um, which prohibits racial discrimination in hiring um, by federal employers and federal contractors as well. Um, so, you know, in theory, this is supposed to provide equal employment for um, black workers. Uh, in practice, it has some impacts um, and it does lead to a slight uptick in the example of the Brooklyn Navy Yard and the number of uh, black workers that we have there, but it does not open up major opportunities for black workers to work and supervisory roles and get into those, um, you know, skilled professions. Uh, the vast majority of them are classified as laborers. The vast majority um, are unclassified employees, meaning they uh, have a contract for the duration of the war plus six months. Um, so it did create some new opportunities, um, but not to the level that was hoped uh, when the executive order um, was passed. And it would be another 20 years um, before, uh, you know, we have um, major legislation that, that would lead to um, true, you know, fair employment practices. Um, actually, if we jump ahead here, and actually, you know, this agitation um, continued throughout the war um, <clears throat> as uh, various organizations, uh, including the NAACP, um, you know, push back uh, against the employment practices of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And again, alleging that there is outright discrimination uh, against workers on the job and also in the exclusion of workers um, from job opportunities uh, as well. Um, so this is, some, you know, they, they call it the, the Navy Yard Jim Crow, um, and this would, you know, continue throughout the war. Um, so, but you, again, you do start to see more black workers uh, in the yard and you start to see more 
black people in general around the yard because they start to open up more opportunities um, for black sailors um, to, to enlist. Um, but again, they're excluded from the officer ranks uh, up until 1944. Um, so that's one big change that you see in, in the workforce. And of course, black workers were almost entirely excluded from unions. Um, we have uh, an oral history that was done several years ago um, with the labor historian, uh, Howard Zinn. Um, and he talks about the, uh, I wish, um, I wish we had a recording of it. We, we don't, we just have a transcript of it. But he talks about how, uh, yeah, the, the, the unions, the AFL and the CIO, um, as well as the um, United Federal Workers of America um, and the kind of sort of white collar unions within the yard basically excluded black workers from them during World War II. Um, so that's one big change you see. Um, another big change is of course, women coming into the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And again, all of these women coming in with almost without exception are unclassified employees. So they're coming in for the duration of the war plus six months. Uh, they start to come in in the summer of 1942. And this is a story we've told many, many times uh, before. Um, but I wanted to play a little clip again of uh, Ida and Sylvia talking about um, their experiences with pay uh, and how there was uh, essentially a, a separate pay scale and titles given in order to uh, put women on a different, uh, different scale. Someone told me, I think they were, uh, they were interviewing people for the Navy Yard. We were, they were going to hire women. And that must have been 1942. Two, it's two. So what we went, were interviewed, and we had to take an exam, which was called, lear uh, we were called Mechanic Learners, which yes. was a new right. title. Yeah. And we were paid about half of what the third men had on the ship. And then at one point, I don't know, maybe after a year or so, we began to ask for equal pay for equal work. <laughs> and uh, there was a union, but I don't remember which union. An OT? They stepped in for us, and eventually we got that one, that dollar fourteen cents an hour, which the men had been getting. We started out with, with a new title. They were called third class soldiers, and we were called when we were hired mechanic learners. So they gave us a fraction of what the men got. Yeah. It's 60 something cents an hour. Yeah, I thought it was less. Oh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, like 50 cents. So eventually we got the same. Well, after a big fight. Yeah, were you then? Yes. Did you get the title as well? Yes, we got the title, and then from there, I don't know how long a time you got to be a second class welder, which was a dollar twenty six, and then a third class, a first class welder. How much? No, it was very. It was good. low, but it went from one fourteen to one twenty six. Oh, I think it was well. It doesn't matter. It was very low. To one forty something, but as low as it was for that time. I earned more money than my father. One point, they let they took the women out onto the ship because one of their arguments was when we asked for higher pay that you weren't working on the ship like the men were, and we said that we weren't refusing. You just weren't sending us out on the ship. So they did. You enjoy it? Enjoy the welding? I think so. I do. I do because it's skill and it's, yeah, I did. it's it's. Very satisfying to I, think you can do it well. I didn't really mind going to work. And it was a job. Yeah, so there, you know, there was agitation on their behalf to get that, that equal pay for equal work. However, again, within short order after the war ended, you know, all of these women workers uh, were released. Um, and so there wasn't you know, competition for those positions anymore. And again, they face a similar problem to what they did after the Civil War as well, which is that, you know, large numbers of positions were promised to, you know, the millions and millions of veterans that were coming back, you were guaranteed a, a federal job, and they just didn't have places for them. Um, so, you know, again, you see, um, you know, workers kind of being forced out um, of the Navy Yard, you um, during this time period when we see a huge demobilization from about 70,000 workers down to under 20,000 within a span of about 18 months. Um, so <clears throat> that meant also getting rid of some of the, the longer tenured workforce uh, as well that had been there before World War II. 
Um, but as we get into um, kind of the, the post-war um, period, um, you know, in 1955, um, we see the merger of the AFL and the CIO, and eventually the organization that would come to represent all of the workers in the Navy Yard at the end of the Yard's naval history uh, would be um, the Metal Trades Council. Um, now, the metal trades had started to be organized um, by the AFL uh, in 1908, as I mentioned before, but again, these were really siloed um, by the specific um, skills and, and different shops, uh, whereas in the post-war period, the metal trades council would become sort of the umbrella union for uh, the workers, uh, at least the blue collar workers, um, the industrial workers within the, the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, they actually would finally get the right to fully organize and be recognized and negotiate on wages uh, in 1962 um, under um, President Kennedy um, would sign that law. Uh, and so uh, actually one of the um, things that the Metal Trade Council did was erect a monument um, to President Kennedy after he was killed. So here you can see in 1964, it was erected uh, in the southwest corner of the yard. Um, sort of near the Sand Street Gate. Um, and uh, I think that's Jean Kennedy Smith, um, the woman who's standing there, um, who's John F. Kennedy's sister. Um, I don't know uh, what happened um, to this monument. <clears throat> um, we've actually had a couple people inquire about this over the years and I haven't been able to come up with a satisfactory answer about what happened to it. The buildings that were around here uh, were demolished in the 1970s. I believe behind them, that's, that's building number four, which is not there anymore. Um, however, in one of the articles in the Brooklyn Navy Yard Shipworker, it mentions that on this site where the monument was installed is where there used to be a bell that was then removed from this location. So that may be the same 10 hour workday bell um, that we talked about at the very beginning of the program. Um, but ultimately, you know, the Metal Trades Council would not have any power to stop the federal government from what they wanted to do uh, just a few months after this photo was taken, uh, which was to shut down the Brooklyn Navy Yard completely. Um, and one of the main justifications that the Navy gave was this study that was done in 1962 by Arthur Anderson, uh, the accounting consulting firm, um, basically arguing that the public yards were too expensive. Um, going back to the Eisenhower administration, um, you know, they were trying to these administrations were trying to extricate the federal government from really any kind of manufacturing um, at all. Um, and so they were trying to get the, the, the federal government out of the business of shipbuilding and ship repair. Um, and so one of the main arguments they made was that the largely unionized workforce of the federal Navy yards was more expensive uh, than the non-union workforce of private shipyards, mostly located in the South. Um, and so cost was a big consideration. There were also, you know, infrastructure and geographic considerations that were also um, looked at, including the height of the Brooklyn Bridge and Manhattan Bridge and the size of ships that could fit under it. Um, but this was one of the key considerations is that just that in general, the federal government wanted to get out of this business um, and move it into private industry. And so today we still have four federal shipyards, um, but uh, they don't really compete with private industry in that they don't build any ships and they're largely doing highly specialized types uh, of repair work. <clears throat> um, and so um, there's not so much of a one-to-one -one comparison um, when we look at the types of jobs that are being done for the Navy by private shipyards versus the, versus the public yards. Um, the federal government is trying to recapitalize those yards and, and make some major investments in them. And there's even talk about actually acquiring a, a new public yard. Um, I think that's sort of a pipe dream, but, but we shall see. Um, but that kind of brings us to the, to the end, of our, end of our story here, uh, looking at the, the labor history of the, of the Navy Yard up until 1966. And of course, we can talk more about uh, labor history um, in, in the yard, um, you know, during the era of sea train shipbuilding in the 1970s. Uh, and of course, now we have hundreds of businesses in the yard, and many of the workers in the yard are represented um, by unions um, as well um, today. Um, but uh, that's a story for another day as we're, we're completely out of time. But I want to thank everybody so much for joining us. Um, thank you for your questions. So thank you all so much. Have a great day.